Principal Sporter, <laughs> closing desk. I'd like to begin the uh, finance committee meeting. Uh, Mr. President, do you have the committee to call to order? Yeah. We are called to order. Mr. Jeswick, uh, tonight's finance committee meeting is going to consist of a brief overview of the budget uh, and its current state development uh, with an emphasis on some of the future's obligations. And then we're going to talk about the switch gear a little bit. Mr. Joseph. Okay, to get started, um, we want to review the 1819 budget with um, at the next board meeting. We're going to have to get to approval of where we're at at that point. The budget's still a work in process. Um, not too much has changed at this point besides some of the savings uh, we added in at one point. Like I said, I'm currently working on, on things with the budget. So by the May 14th or 15th, whatever that actual date is, that board meeting, we'll have it ready to be voted on so we can advertise that budget at this point. Um, hey Chris, if I could pause you quickly. So for the board, May we have to pass a preliminary budget until there's an official name. Preliminary, preliminary budget, that'll work. Preliminary, there's a preliminary budget we pass. Uh, there is a different name for it now, but that's what it is. And then the final budget has to be passed in June. We have to have 30 days from the time the preliminary budget is passed until the final budget. So. A member just kicked in. I believe it's the proposed final budget followed by the final budget. So that makes sense. Yeah. That can sign right to you, Chris. It's a quote of Bill Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Okay. So as you can see, we're, we're around the same place as we were. Pretty much exactly the same. 27.6 in revenue, 28.4 million in expenses. The percentages break out. As you can see where our revenues, they stay consistent with the 60% local taxes. Big part of that's the real estate taxes, the local income tax, 31% from the state government, and 3% from the federal. So we know a lot of our uh, budgeted expenses, 73% is salary and benefits. So our fund, fund balance, excuse me, our fund balance with the numbers becoming more actual for 17, 18, I would look at the end at about the 1.43 million mark after, I think we were at about 1.3 last time. So I was going to say, can I make a request that for the next um, iteration of this, could we put the actual fund balance as of the end of last year when we have confirmed numbers? Yes. And then an estimated. Yes, when we're getting close, we won't be quite confirmed because we haven't went through the audit and the year end hasn't closed, but it's much estimated actual. We'll have the 17 number. We'll have the, the Audited 17, the fund 17 balance, yes. and then we'll have a potential right. 18. Right, we have that later on. And then a, right. Just because see where we're at right now. Because if, if we're talking about a budget of a $700,000 deficit or $500,000 deficit, and we only have a million four, we're going to understand we make people nervous. So, okay. Uh, Chris, I'm thinking that last year the salary level was closer to 70. Did it go up? Well, we have a lot of folks raises, jump steps. So we have more jump steps than we do higher salaries going out. And then the PEASERS, the PEASERS bumps a little bit, even though it's a percentage, it's 1% on all these new salaries that are higher too. So, you know, it all, it all works its way in there. Um, big thing as we continue to say is the pension crisis. Um, it is what it is at this point. We're gonna continue the percentage evens out, but as our salaries go up across the board, you could say the percentage is leveling out, but the cost of the pieces is going up. It just continues to kind of skyrocket for us, and with some more major jump steps coming up in the next five years, that's going to continue to go up as you see the pieces percentage goes up. Um, as you see over the next five years, we're going to go from 33.43 to an estimated 36.32, so 3% jump with you know, what we're going to have in salaries adding up turns into a major increase for us. But Chris, again, just to put it in context, we came from four and a half. So four and a half percent instead of three. So the, the immense pain that we felt is slowing. It's still a huge number, but it's slow. It's continuing to bump up. I, I wouldn't the say percentage either. is not going to continue to bump. It's it's flattening right, out right but around our, 30, our expense is going to continue to bump based on if, what if we our have people cost wise. continues to go up. Then which that's the projection over the next right. five years. But not not months. the way it has for the last five. Like the last five years have been. Well, yeah, you had your original bump, but 
being that we have positions going up to their top level across the board, that's, that's a real killer. So even though that percentage bumps, your cost They'll, they'll really inch up as our personnel cost inches up, but we're not going to see an increase like we had in the last five years. I guess, I guess what he's trying to emphasize is it's almost getting to be irrelevant about the climb. Even with the tapering off, because we're so high and we have X amount of people that are jumping with, with the jump step at their with cost, high salary, people. which it's is huge population, it's a big, it's already a big expense for us, even a chunk of our budget. Right, right. So it, it, it's in the past couple of years, it hasn't even been the climb that's eating the chunk of our budget. That big chunk of budget remains and continues to keep growing because we have such a huge. It, and it's a combination of both because you know, you, you start the climb and it really hits you at first, wow. But then you have, you know, 20 employees getting 40, you know, we're in that $40,000 range on 20 employees. So 33% of that 40,000, it's, you know, we're over 12, 12 to $14,000 times 20 over the next five years. And that's a consistent set cost. So, but yeah, my point is, as you went, as, as we had a $400,000 contribution to pension in 2011, we're now three and a half million. That's the bulk of the pain. Yes, we're going to go up, and yes, it's but not it's, going away. The only problem is it's that consistent pain. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I'm just that saying it's not going to go from three and a half to eight. Right, but it's like it, like it's three point one million dollar million dollars into our budget that we ever had to deal with right. over this past time frame. So, um, so, like we said, the the jump steps that leads to that that adds to it. So yep. yeah, just have to keep budgeting for it. Um, as we now increase burdens on school districts, I think we've discussed this all right now. Um, one way to look at for every million dollars in salary, and this is all employees across the board, that's uh, $334,000 with that 33%. So maybe that kind of can give people a realization of how much money we are funding on every million dollars. And as we said, look how much we have in salary. So I think we're around the 12 million mark. So that's without salary and benefits. So you get $1,334,000 on every million dollars, adds up. Um, that increase is sustained over the next five years. So like we said, we just discussed that. And kind of a final note is the pensions, the way they're paid out, really doesn't matter. But it's a lot, the highest three years of the salary, not the last three. So that's a good thing to remember with all of this. Um, this is just kind of a chart here. I think it might look familiar. <laughs> but. Uh, just explains kind of the member contributions, how those kind of inch their way up, um, the employer contributions, how they've been flowing, and then how much our benefits and expenses have went over over that time frame. So you can see just the big jump up to the over the 4.5 million. Um, clean this chart up a little bit with, and you can see the rates as Jim was talking about here. Okay, we were at 4.76, but as you can see, there was that steady hike as we kept going up. Looks to be, doesn't appear to be going down by estimations at this point. And as I said, the, you know, the higher our salaries get, the higher that burden becomes. Okay, and then this was a breakout. Um, I stuck with one of the charts that were in a previous presentation. As you can see, there's not a ton that are over 100 when you take 783 people that are over 100, you know, you're getting into $78 million, I believe, with it. And, but even though the ones under 20 times that, by the one, 113,000 employees, the numbers get pretty high, too. So, I mean, you're talking billions of dollars in this whole pension system because of the way the crisis is what, because of the underfunding. So, you know, that gives you a big picture of everything there. The quick takeaway for me was that the pension is not a it's not a Cadillac plan like we've heard defined in the past. It's really um, a, a relatively modest pension, but it's still a pension, and its, it's numbers are huge for us. But it's not. It's a pretty good one, though. <laughs> from from the standpoint of what the average person has for retirement, from the rest of the world, you're absolutely right. But it's their payouts are, it, are. But what I will say is, you know, you come into a school district. When you compare a pension for you know a school district or some other state employees with what we have, I mean, that's a very attractive bonus to working in a district. You know, it, it helps you make a decision where you know some of the trade-off is you know you go into private versus public. But you know, I had a gentleman explain what you would have to put into a retirement to get out what you would at a top level of a salary at certain 
you know, areas within a school district, and it'd be very tough to save that much. You know, he gave me a number around two million. You would have to save over a lifetime to pull the pension out. You'd be able to pull up to when you're in a top area times your percentage. So, I mean, it, it's a pretty pretty good plan. <laughs> okay, charter school costs. This is a huge cost for this, and this is something. We don't have a ton of control over, but it's an area where we could pull money at, where PEASERS were kind of stuck. It is what it is. There's not much control over this, but we can really look into students. Um, you know, we have to have our team that handles charter schools and enrollment really, really stay up to date on the truancy, foul citations for students that aren't, you know, a lot of them probably have or absentees and such. And, we can't pull everyone back because everyone's in for different reasons. It might be beneficial because, say, if you're an Olympic level gymnast, you don't have time to go to school, but that cyber school and such allows them flexibility. So, but there are students out there, and um, one of the things I wanted to point out, we just received a bill, and they bought us from the $13,623 to $14,821 per regular ed student and then the special ed, we're gonna go from 27,000 up to over 29,000. So anybody that we'd be able to pull back in based on certain certain situations at that time, you know, that's something we really have to look into. And then the other thing is we've discussed at length over the past few <laughs> board meetings is the energy saver project. We have to budget for facility upgrades because Certain things, at some point, these need done. So there's not much of a choice. If something breaks down, say the switch gear goes, we're shutting down school for a time frame. So how do we work that into the budget? That's certain things we have to stay aware of. A couple additional issues. Act one, that will limit the amount of revenue districts can raise on their own. Um, then here's all the, other, all the other things we have to pay for for student services such as the McKinney-Vento homeless transportation, that's on us. ELL services for students. Special education and maintenance <coughs> for the special education. Once again, transporting all these students, paying out the schools, you know, that, that per child fee. Um, tax collection rate, we only have so much control over that. As we know, it's very difficult um, to go much over the index rate. But also, um, our ability to appeal the property tax. I know that's been a big concern at <laughs> Dr. Piper's too, where we can't argue it. If it goes through, they appeal it. We have no way to fight back on it. Chris, so. Chris go, go back to the previous screen, too. Now, party with the charter schools, we are aggressively going after the charters for additional money based on the pens. That is, kids who, you know, we're responsible for keeping track of kids when they're in the charters. But we have kids that aren't going. So when we're going, we've been getting money back from charters. We just had a check, I believe, from the PA Cyber. Yes. For, for a kid to have one that, that we got to them, and the kid was assigned a month for, and we're still getting billed for it, and work for them to get monies back from that. So we're trying to keep a monitor on that, and ideally, if we go down the road, if we never run a charter school, we have to bring more of those kids back, and we're looking at a pilot class in that next year. But that's something we're trying to fight, and Sandy Eaton's really been doing a nice job with that, our new registrar, on getting those out. If you can go to the next slide real quick. Two things I want to point out with McKinney Vento and ELL, that ELL is English language learners. As you know, we had a lot of kids come this past year from Syria and from Yemen and some Middle Eastern Iraq and some other Middle Eastern countries. That could slow down, or that could spike up again, depending on what's going on. So right now it's down a little bit from where it was earlier in the fall. Most of those kids are, are living in Part 8. Uh, and we have to keep an eye on how we're handling that. We get our ELL services from the immediate unit. Uh, so we save money by doing that. Because not only do they pay for the instruction, but all the testing, all the resource materials go with that. Uh, if we did in-house, we'd still have to go to the IEP to get additional money. So we work with them on that. Kenny Vento with Homeless, we've been doing better this past year than we did the prior year with less kids that are, say, homeless and they want to go to the school of their choice. And you know, if they got displaced and they're Imperial and we're 
still bringing them here because they have the ability to go to that school. We have to provide transportation. Uh, the one year we had kids in Monroeville, we had kids in the city, we had kids in Imperial. So we're driving, we're driving them from quite a distance. Uh, a lot of districts will work with us. We're working with Jenny Hunt and Clarendon, transporting a kid, we'll split the cost. But again, that, that varies. So when we say that some of those things we can't control, we get some bubbles there, we sort of base it on what we spent over the last year. The other issue is maintenance of effort. You know, we think we're getting money back for special education because we've had some kids graduate that have had AIDS. Uh, and we anticipate, from talking with Dr. Ann, we get about 90,000 coming back from that because those kids have graduated and exited the right fees. But again, I could have a student come in and needs two uh, individual one-on-one -on -one AIDS and have a combination of physical and intellectual disability, and we would have to assume that. We wouldn't have a choice in it. Uh, a lot of times we don't know some of these numbers until July or August when kids are making last minute decisions to come to school. So I just wanted to comment on that as you move through the question. So with our proposed budget, we were able to raise up to 0.98 mills. So we'll have to vote on that at some point to verify it. Um, that takes us up to the 23.5 mills rate for the school district. I, I left the left the cost discretionary spending at zero right now because we are still working through the budget. Uh, we made some savings. Now this 731k, uh, Mr. Riley put in 100,000 our fund balance reserve. So that 100,000 is part of that. So we're really at about 631k. But I wanted to share that 731k with that 100,000 dollars in our budgetary reserve. Yeah, 100,000 is that the same 100,000 we typically have in? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're just leaving it. So we should just think of that as truly 731 because that's yes, yes, but in case, in case break glass in case of emergency, right? Type thing. Yeah. So, um, as we stated earlier, estimated fund, fund balance of 1.43 by the end of 19 school year, and then you know, some of our goals we have to control cost um, and really minimize the impact with the students on um, what sacrifices we would have to make as far as that goes, but. You know, we'll continue to do our best as far as that goes, continue to find things as much as possible. Um, we've even had some simple things with uh, Joe Riddell and I are in technology. We sat down with the printer company. He said, these bills don't look right. We argued with them. I said, hey, not argued, but went through with, with the gentleman. And hey, look back a couple bills. They were able to find $6,000 in refunds just off that. And he goes, we're good. We can adjust your billing. Well, Let's go back another th three months from when we started with you because if this was a problem before, it's probably still, it was probably, you know, a problem the whole time. So, you know, we're doing those things to save money and, uh, you know, everything. And Mr. Mantich can men mention some contracts he made for books. They send us out eight years over a four year payment where we were paying four for six, I believe. So, I mean, we have some people really working for schools that, so we don't have to sacrifice. Chris, if you can go back one slide, real quick. The, so the, one, the fund balance, if it's if you're guessing, estimating 1.4 in the next year, the $700,000 deficit this coming year, that means our your estimated fund balance the other should be 2.1, 2.2. Huh? It would be 2.16. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. And this is just kind of an overview, um, maybe a chart similar to previous. As you can see, we, we just kind of go through here. It's I can email this to everybody if you want a closer look. I know these numbers are kind of small to see from where everybody's at, but um, it just gives the base. If it tells our local or state or federal, so instead of just saying percentage, you see the actual number. Um, you see where the, where the salaries are hitting us, and where I said you know we're at about twelve million dollars in salaries, but you had thirty three percent, then thirty six percent when those salaries are going to be even higher because of the number of jump steps over the next five years. So, and then just some of our other costs. Um, right now, we don't have anything budgeted for any capital expenditures at this point, but the nice thing about that is one of the reasons we don't, because if that energy saver project comes in now, it should be money we get back a little bit with our utility bills, energy bills and such. So, you know, that's a nice project we're working, working towards. Um, that sums up this presentation, if there's any questions on that. 
Chris, this was a lot to digest. I, I would assume you're going to email the press. Yes, I'll email the presentation to everyone. And then if you have questions, you can email, give me a call. I'm not going too far, so <laughs> I'm, I'm around. And I think those that have emailed me, I get back to you. So yeah, try to do so in a timely effort. If I could suggest then that if we, the next two items that we had on finance, if we address that in the regular meeting, because I know we have students here from 7 o'clock for recognition, and then I can talk about the title one, and you can talk about the switch gear, and we'll both talk on that. But I think if we conclude that, and then get into the student recognition in the regular meeting, then we can end our reports. Chris, the presentation was good. Thank you. Any, any questions on the preview before he shuts it down? Nope. And, and we'll, we'll also make this available on the website as well. The final version. Mm -hmm. Yep. Leave that up. Is that distracting the way that I No. It's just, it's just blurry to me without my glasses on. <laughs> I'm not distracted. And that concludes the Finance Committee meeting for this evening. The April 16th, 2018 meeting of the Carlington School District Board of Directors is called to order. Chris, do you mind leading us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Secretary, please call the roll. Director Hunchar? Here. Director Mendoza? Here. Director O'Brien? Here. Director Richardson? Here. Director Simpson? Here. Director Zaleski? Here. Director Apple? He's not able to be here tonight. Director Shriver? Here. I'll uh, entertain any public questions that people have on items that are on our agenda for tonight. Does anyone have a question about an agenda item? Seeing no questions, we'll move on. Uh, Dr. Pfeiffer, is there a presentation today? Uh, yes. Uh, we'd like to recognize uh, some student athletes and uh, some student uh, Accomplishments, and I'd like to begin that by introducing Mr. Locke. Thank you. Um, could I have you guys come up, please? Eddie and Noah, please. Um, I'm proud to recognize these two young athletes uh, this evening because of two, their accomplishments and their respective sports. Uh, not only do they represent their teams well, but they perform well individually. And it is a tribute to their hard work in everything that they do in the school. Uh, this morning when I was driving in, I actually passed one of the athletes here, Eddie, when he was doing his morning run on his way to school. And it's work ethics like that that led Eddie to in the 113 weight class division, a section runner-up, a fifth place in the Whitfield and wrestling, and a sixth place in the Southwest Regionals, and advanced to the state tournament. So the hard work and dedication has paid off, and I want to congratulate you. Especially. <laughs> Owen also demonstrated some success in the bowling this year. Owen qualified uh, a regional qualifier, a section qualifier, and advanced to the uh, people. In advance uh, to regionals for bowling. And he had a 190 average. Nice. <laughs> so if we have the uh, faculty Student bowl off. I think I'm going to So, congratulations. Eddie and Owen. Eddie and Owen Calamon. 
What grade are you guys in? Twelve. Twelve. Five. Twelve. Twelve. Thank you, Joe. Great work. Congratulations. Thank you. What, you know, one of the things that we look to do is provide opportunities for kids to have access to rigorous courses uh, through their own effort and inclination and interest. And discuss that as acceleration uh, so that the more kids that are exposed to the higher level work, the more opportunity they'll have upon graduation. And talking about acceleration tonight and some things we've been working on are Dr. Andler and Mr. Mantich. Dr. Thank you. Uh, in your board packet, we kind of provided with two documents. One is the uh, procedural guidelines for our acceleration, and the second one is a kind of a working packet. If somebody be, um, yeah, that one right there. That would be the one they would work through to provide data, give us the information to perform decision. We'll talk about more about that second one. <coughs> Anyway, we did these guidelines and procedures and were developed in order to help us meet the intellectual and developmental needs of our students by offering instructional programming capable of challenging them to achieve at their highest level. After visits we made to other school districts, and Dr. Andler and uh, Dr. Piper went to Quaker Valley at one point, and Dr. Andler and I went down to AIE 1, and we had some meetings down there, and we looked at some other school districts' policies, and we kind of modeled ours kind of after a school district we knew it already had a PDE approved program, we kind of started, you know, looking at that one and kind of developing our under that particular uh, guideline. This protocol should provide direction for the district and subject, course, and grade level acceleration as an intervention for, for providing challenging educational opportunities for advanced learners as identified within Chapter 1. To clear up some confusion people have between acceleration and uh, enrichment, We've defined acceleration as a moderation of the regular classroom curriculum that enables any student, and that would include ELL, at-risk, economically disadvantaged, gifted, and twice or multiple exceptionality students to progress either faster and complete courses quicker in less time or in an earlier age. In other words, acceleration correlates a student's educational placement with their mastery level and not necessarily their chronological age. So acceleration opportunities we're looking to provide but not limited to be moving through the curriculum at a faster pace, advanced grading placement, the grade placement in core academic areas, and earning college credit while still in high school. This protocol will provide a guidance in this area so we can make sure that the students, the, uh, there is a need for these particular students for acceleration and not just a one in that particular area. So if students are put through the process and are recommended for acceleration, we will focus on providing these students with challenging enrichment activities within their current classroom they will also meet their intellectual and developmental needs of these particular students. So now Dr. Allen is going to go through some of the criteria and steps for identification. Now this is for all students. This is not just for students who are already identified as gifted students. That process will take place through the GIP process. So this is for all students, not just those who are identified as gifted. But some of the criteria that we're going to be looking at is going to consider single subject acceleration when the student is performing at least one or more years above their current instructional level. So for example, they're in fifth grade and they're performing sixth grade work pretty well, that, that will be the student that will be considered. Um, and they're also showing an aptitude for performing two years above that grade level as well. So we want to make sure they're ready to perform at that level. So some of the criteria that we'll be looking at is demonstrating a need based on already interventions happening in the classroom. That they're already going above and beyond what's happening in their current classroom. Also, ESSA scores, are they performing the minimum 95 percentile if they're available? You know, as we go up, as kids get into the high school years, we're all now looking at keystones, are they performing advanced on their keystones in that specific subject that we're looking at? Additionally, CBT, which is the classroom diagnostic test scores that the students already format PFAS projections, which monitors and measures growth, as well as a review of cur curriculum-based assessments, demonstration mastery in those assessments, and then also the grade level of which they would be performing at. So again, going back to fifth grade example, say they were, we're looking at accelerating them through sixth grade math, looking at an end of the year sixth grade assessment and how that student performs. 
Additionally, they also must express and show the sincere desire to want to be accelerated. So that's not, uh, my teacher thinks I should do it, so therefore I'm going to have to do it. But that they want to, they want to do it, they want to learn more. The district acceleration committee, which will be comprised of the building level, is going to be comprised of the principal, the student teacher, the guidance counselor, as well as one of the school psychologists. They will look at qualitative evidence of social and emotional maturity, academic motivation, and persistence for task completion, and intense interest in a specific academic area, as well as their attendance. And how this process will take place is that a referral will be made, be made by the teacher, or a parent can make that referral. The, the team will work through that workbook of data, looking at pulling the students' data information, and if they meet those criteria over 75%, and then move on to the next level. And that next level would be an assessment called the Iowa Acceleration Scale. And that scale measures aptitude for acceleration above and beyond their current chronological age and grade level. Once a student meets a certain scale on that, then an acceleration plan will be developed based on the team's recommendations and then monitor it on a weekly, regular basis so that it doesn't set the student up for failure but success. So that is the, part, the process we're going to run through with that. The Iowa Acceleration Scale, the new assessment we're working with, and that is in one of the new assessments that a lot of school districts in the area are looking at for acceleration. Because it it's that aptitude piece that has always been missing. So, Mr. Manchukul. Yeah, Dr. Adam, make sure that since this is a PSSA speech, we, we also talk about how this will affect the, the students and the PSSA. Because PDE policy dictates that students take the at grade level PSSA for the grade to which they are enrolled in. So, let's say, for example, we have a student who would get a course level acceleration, not a grade level acceleration. Those still, for example, right now we have a student who's in second grade taking third grade math. Okay, so he was, he was, course only accelerated. Since he's enrolled in second grade, he will not take the third grade PSSA this year. So next year when he's in third grade, when he'll be taking fourth grade math, he will end up taking the third grade PSSA because that's the grade he's enrolled in. Now if we would do a whole grade acceleration, we take the whole student, for example, from sixth grade and skip the entire grade level and go to seventh grade, he's now enrolled in seventh grade, so he'll take the seventh grade assessments because that's what we've dictated he's enrolled in. So just so we're clear, that when the assessments come into play, that's how they would, they, would, they would play out. So that's kind of what we want to talk about is highlighting on our particular policies we have here today. So if, uh, if you have any questions, you'd be more than happy to answer. Questions? I'm, I'm curious, um, experience from other local districts, what are the things that they found that they like that they really think are working well? And what are some things that maybe they didn't expect with what Change in culture. That was the that was the biggest piece of that I got from Quaker Valley was it's just change in thought process. It they phrased it as educational goodies per se. Okay, removing that label that you have to be a certain area or certain label to have be able to experience those educational opportunities. When you open up for all students, it it changes the framework and getting people to realize that that is needed for the students, that all students can accelerate and all students can excel at a higher level. They said that was the most difficult was getting that thought process to change. Thought process for the teachers, for the kids, for the parents, or? All, all of the above, all of the above. Because that whole group instruction, I think I've talked about it before, was that whole group one tier instruction <coughs> doesn't work for everybody. So being able to differentiate, and that's one of the things we're looking at moving forward next year as well, is doing some differentiate instruction, professional development with our teachers to really work on not just our middle kids that we tailor that same level but hitting our upper group our lower group so that all students can grow based either on your own estimates or just based on talking to the other districts is there a guess as to a percentage of our population that will eventually become accelerated um, in any one subject i don't know if it's based on 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 a percentage more or the, it's, it's more of an individual need yeah, you because know, when we started dealing with this particular subject matter, it seems like we were being approached by more of a want than more it was a student need. So we're trying to take that kind of the, I think the one and I need balance out. Yeah, the we're, we're trying to use objective data to benefit as many kids as we can to give them opportunity. 
So for example, if there's different competitions and a, and a kid can demonstrate by his performance in the class and by a specific interest that he may have, say it's a history bowl, that he should have an opportunity to be able to participate in that as well as a student in a different program. Similarly, if I have a kid through scheduling, we always have a tough time with single classes. And let's say it's a kid that thinks, you know what, I, I can take statistics, Mr. Cozy, but I can also take French 4 and balance out within that schedule, maybe they're off at the same period, but if it's okay with the parents, and then the kid can take, you know, I'm going to spend three days a week in this class, and I'm going to spend two days a week in this class, and alternate it in subsequent weeks, provided I can keep my grade up. So I think there's other examples that I think would benefit the general student body to get them an opportunity. Let's say we have a student who's, who progresses through the science department, it's like, well, you know, I really like to take physics too, or, you know, I've exceeded my math quota. Uh, what are we putting in place? A lot of times we talk about differentiation of instruction for kids who are struggling academically. What we're really talking about here is differentiation of instruction for kids who are successful. And how are they successful? What opportunities that, that's not necessarily open to a kid who's not given? But a kid who works darn hard and a kid who has an interest and, and have the proclivity to do the work and get ahead. And I think we should make that opportunity for them. And those are some of the things that other districts moving into the 21st century you're doing. And I think schools can be the same way as it was when we went to school, you know, back in the 20th century. I, I think it's problematic. It's not doing our kids a service. So one of the things that I asked Rachel and Ed to talk about and look at some best practices of the districts are doing, Quaker Valley being one of them, was how can you provide more opportunity for kids? Being a small school and, and wanting to get out of that box that's what we're proposing. We're looking to implement this next year. Yes. I was curious about this, if you're expecting one or two kids per class on average, or is this 12 kids per <coughs> class a year? So what, is the, what are the other districts seeing as far as number of kids after a year or two of implementing this? How many kids actually? <coughs> it comes with awareness. The more there that it is out there, students are aware that this is an option to them, it does increase. So it may it will start off probably as one or two per class, give or take, and then it could grow to 10 to 12. It just depends on the awareness and what, what the, the student said that they were able to qualify under these criteria, how that needs to work. And you had brought up a, a current condition where you have a second grader doing third grade work. Yes. Is, and at the elementary level, it's yes. a little different because you're not, you know, you're not jumping around with classes. Mm -hmm. Do you have the second grader Then they come back. We also have a few students that uh, are kind of crossing over. I, I wouldn't say it's full acceleration from, from sixth to seventh six grade, to seventh, there's a, there's but a they're also taking the sixth grade math, but we're also bringing them up here for pre algebra. So, you know, once they, once they kind of meet the pre algebra requirements, they'll still take the sixth grade kids and say they'll still earn the material that they've got for the seventh grade, and next year, as, as seventh graders, they'll probably be taking up the one, and they'll be taking it in this building. We'll move on to the, the rest of our, uh, of our meeting. Moving on to the minutes section. I'll, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the March 19th, 2018 Finance Committee meeting, the March 19th regular voting meeting, the minutes of that meeting, and the meeting of the April 9th special meeting for general purposes as presented. We'll have a motion for those three central meetings to be approved. Second. Moved by the second. Second. Move to second. Any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. I'll report that we had an executive session prior to this meeting where we discuss personnel matters, negotiations, and real estate. I'll now turn to Dr. Piper for the administrative reports. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to report we are in our second week of PSSA testing uh, in the district, and uh, so far things are going very well. We've only 
only had two students uh, in the whole district who opted out of the exam this year, uh, which always helps us with our participation rate, so we're pretty, very well pleased with that. I want to thank building principals, Mr. Mandich, uh, and the teachers for getting that together. Uh, and it's, uh, it's something we all have to deal with, but I think the kids are pretty well conditioned at this point. <laughs> They understand we don't have a lot of kids storming in here causing disruptions and uh, being unruly during the testing. Uh, one of the things I want to touch base as we're putting our budget together is uh, we anticipate that we're going to get a reduction in our title and our federal fundings, our Title I, Title II, and Title IV. Uh, this is based on the 2016 census, and uh, we won't get the final figures. We hope we'll get them at the Pennsylvania Federal Programs Conference coming up in May. This year, uh, in Title I, for example, the Title I services go to kids who are economically disadvantaged. Uh, we're able to utilize uh, the services to provide those kids with an academic need uh, and give them some more one-to-one -one, uh, instruction in the programs. So currently, we've received $652,452 in Title I monies. We anticipate if it's the cut by the full 15%, the next year we'd be looking at $555,000. Title II monies, and we're not sure if Title II is going to be cut entirely, we use that for class size reduction. If they eliminate Title II, uh, that's $74,102 we do not have. And for Title IV, uh, which we've used for uh, educational quality and helped offset some foreign language classes with that. Uh, the reduction there, if they eliminate it, would be 14621 So we'll know more come the, the Pennsylvania Federal Programs Conference uh, what those figures are concretely, but that's the preliminary uh, fire across the bow that, that they're giving us. Uh, the other items, Mr. Locker and I today, you know, we continue to look at our school safety procedures and emergency response. We're putting trainings in place for next year. Mr. Locker and I were at the intermediate today for an active shooter presentation by the state police. And we're taking some of the suggestions that they put in there into our own plan. And uh, we'll be having a subsequent meeting with the police later on this semester. Uh, the police have been very helpful with us uh, with uh, proactive communication. One of the things that, we're look, that we purchased is an app that we're going to be able to put on the employees' phones. It'll almost be like a, a 911 emergency call, call first responders, thinking that if somebody's on the playground and they don't have access to a phone or they're outside, we'll be able to utilize the app on the phone. Uh, Mr. Ravella walked in, was instrumental in you know, going forward with RAVE to get that program. So that's another layer we're going to have in place as well. One of the things that we're working on for this summer uh, that's, that's a little different, and uh, I have to uh, acknowledge former board member Andrew Sart uh, for having the idea and uh, putting me in touch with Linglisi Mato. Now I probably just butchered his name, but uh, we're developing a South African Student Youth Exchange. We'll have eight students here uh, as part of a larger itinerary where they're going to go to New York City. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia in the summer, and we're setting up some programs there, but they'll be here uh, with our uh, program, and we're going to talk to the NHS kids to talk about having some kids come in the summer, and we're going to show them our building, take a day to go to Parkway, the Energy Innovation Center, and, and do some other regional things in the area, including the Pirates game, and maybe Kennywood and so forth for those kids, and then have a, a ceremony for them so those are things we're getting in place. Then the idea would be we're in the process of developing a trip for our kids and other kids in the area to go to South Africa in 2019. So that, that's pretty exciting. We had a formal meeting uh, today to finalize some details. But uh, we'll see more about that coming forward. And uh, Darby Copeland and I were also at the Energy Innovation Center last week. And we're looking to continue monies to continue with programs with them. Uh, we put in an application to a presentation at Penn State in the fall with North Gusky for the Energy Innovation Center on uh, career development and public school partnerships. 
And in the last three years of the Education Innovation Center, this year we've had students present to us on the wind turbine, which the full scale, uh, not the full scale, but the working wind turbines in place at the Energy Innovation Center. The year before that, the kids worked on a project where they developed uh, different menu options. And the year before that, they worked on the initial design of the building. And what's nice about that program is we utilize uh, kids who may not normally get exposure or get attention because they may not necessarily be in advanced placement programs, but these kids are every bit as motivated, uh, as intuitive, and uh, academically talented and looking at different avenues for like CAD design and, and uh, collaboration and they work with other schools who are part of the consortium uh, at Parkway. South Fayette was involved, Chartiers Valley, uh, and Bethel Park, and everybody that's in our juncture in the Parkway. So that's a pretty exciting opportunity, and we're going to be sure we get the continuation with that program with funds uh, for the next year. So that's what I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, at this time, I'd like to go to, I'm going to, I'm going to skip over you a little bit, uh, Dr. Randler go to Mr. Jeswick to talk about the switch gear. Switch gear, if those of you that were here last week, we talked about the uh, need for uh, some ener from the train, uh, energy operation services, savings uh, for our budget, and we talked about some fiscal plan capital projects. One of them was the switch gear, which is our, our electrical panels, which are original to the buildings. And as we talked about the program and we initially approached the bond, we approached the bond with a zero sum balance so that the savings that we receive balance out the initial investment that we needed the bond for through the energy costs. Uh, the most immediate things you would see would be things like switch outs for LED lights and our lighting, and some heating, and so forth. One of the things we also have to look at is our switch gear, our electric panels, original to the building. As Michelle Herman reminded me, and next year we're going to be looking at the 50th anniversary of the opening of this building, 68-69. So the equipment is 50 years old and frankly there's a safety concern with that equipment. Uh, we've had it in one, our switch gears are in two different locations and you really almost have to replace both of them at the same time. Uh, because if you have newer wiring in and it's mixed with old wiring, there's a cause for a shock or surge that could damage our equipment. But to do that, we have to increase the bond. And Chris is going to talk a little bit about increasing the bond at this point. Chris, I believe the original price that we looked at last week was 3.4 million on the left. The middle column shows if we would split it up. But again, if we split it up, you're looking at combining new wiring with old wiring. Which will most likely with discussions with our facility manager it will limit the life of the life of the uh, right. asset in the switch gear just because the interaction is not a good mix if you're going to sure. be doing it. So, and then the last column is we replace it all at once. And replacing it all at once, you know, we save money by doing it all at one time. If we drag it out or postpone it, the need isn't going to go away. The need's only going to get worse, and we're going to wind up paying more for it down the road. And that was our facility manager's recommendation. If we do it. He feels it would be more do it all versus it was part of it. So everybody's seen these numbers, at least on the board, where you know our goal was zero sum project with everything with the energy saver. Uh, we wanted to limit our payments as much as possible. So when you see this, that's with the train, the understanding is they gave us a number. They said, you know, you're gonna save this much on all your energy savings, all your utilities. So that's a first year savings when this project goes in. I believe the second year they said we would only pay <coughs> one payment for that year. So there's there's also a savings of eighty two eighty two thousand dollars. Then as we start getting in and actually paying some money on, on this project, we're down to thirteen thirteen dollars in savings. So it's about even. And then as you can see, once um payments really kick in, we have about two thousand twenty one to well, that I would consider $532 pretty much even in 2027, where we're going to be on yet where we're paying money out. Now, we would still have to pay the whole loan 
with everything but those energy savings, that's the offset. So once we get to 2029, we're back in the positive again where the energy savings will outweigh the bond payments at that point. And, and Chris, if I could just interrupt, I think just I'll, I'll shortcut just for a second. And the board, the board last meeting approved the first council call. Yes, the approved that four. But and I think we're all sensitive to making sure that we're providing the district with what it needs. And if you're saying you need the switch gear, I think everyone would be supportive of that. The only caveat would be that um, if, if you're, if you and Gary and Dennis are recommending going to column F and, and at that expense level, then the simple solution is that if you're committing that you'll be able to reduce the operating budget by the delta between columns D and F, and if you'll commit to that, then I think we'll approve the, we might approve the, uh, <laughs> Thank you for the look, please. I appreciate it. <laughs> Bring me back to reality. <laughs> and we might be we might be very open to approving that as long as we're getting a commitment that you'll find a way to, to reduce the operating budget by that by that well, amount. Well, I know we all know the situation where you're in. We all know with what we have coming up, salary expense wise, with teasers and everything. Right. So those those are real costs that are going to be out there. So you know we can work as much as possible with it to see where we can. At this moment, I can't give an absolute guarantee that that number will be in shape. We'll keep building towards that, but it's gonna be elimination of other projects through the districts like general, such as some construction, some things to be repaired. But as we get into it, as Dennis said, you know, the best way to go would be to do this all at once. I don't think he really felt there was too much of a way to do half the project, but that's, right. that, that's his call. Okay. So, you know, as you can see, the numbers get higher. The things I can sell you on on this project with it is as we go down, here's our total payout. So if we just do the energy project, we're gonna have $381,000 in savings by the time this is all said and done. If and, we're and then we'll continue to, to accrue savings every year after that. Right, right. right. Okay. As long as the life of the project goes with everything in it. Right. Now, the one thing you have to look at here on the final project in Act, where we can add the whole million dollars to do the switch here. The switch here is $1 million. So okay, we do have the savings, but if you look at it this way, that switch gear with the energy project would cost us, the cost of the entire project would be $976,000. So that's over a 20 year lease. So the way, way, one way I kind of look at this is based on that, so we build this into the project. We have a million dollar, million dollar switch gear. And like you said, it, you know, it is a safety hazard at this point. The value of that with the energy saver, we're down to nine. What we will pay over the lifetime of that is $976,000 replacing that. So that's below that million dollar cost of it, which you know you eliminate with the interest and such. It's the best value we're going to get at it is if we do it right now. Now we have to figure out how to, how to go about, how to work this into the budget. Fortunate thing is, we're not. We're only paying forty-one thousand out in two thousand twenty. We'd be up to one twenty-seven at that point. So that's something we will have to work on. Salary projections. There are added expenses. We have to work around other construction costs. It it would be it would be a tight decision. But as we talked about other you know situations, we're in a position where we have to distinguish need from want. So if that switch here goes in two or three years, we have to pay a whole nother bond issuance. And I, I'm not the expert on when it's going to go, but yeah, you know, we have to pay another bond issuance, more financing fees. Where, like I said, if we wrap this into that project, we're getting this million dollar switch here, and we're only paying nine hundred and seventy six thousand dollars out on the whole whole big picture. So, and as the time value of money goes, if you can finance over that twenty years, that amount's going to go down each year, hopefully, unless something very crazy happens in our world. So, yeah, that, that, I think that's the best way to look at it, is the opportunity cost. Because where we add it, that switch gear, something major happens with it in two to three years. It's gonna cost us more. The financing's not gonna be as reasonable. So, I think it's tough to say, where are we gonna put in this? We, we have to find it, but if we go in three years, it's going to be a much more expensive project. And once again, we're in a need versus one situation. So, but that's I, something but we have to I, think. But it's, it's true as that is. It, but I don't want to overlook the fact that we're really dealing with a safety hazard. 
but we've got equipment that's 50 years old where the current has burned through the metal door. And if people are afraid of shock, it can be utilized. And knowing that, if we have a safety accident, somebody gets seriously injured, it's going to come back to now. We know there's a safety hazard exists that's, that could do some real physical harm to the person, and we didn't know anything about it. And, and that's what worries me. As much as the finance part, I, I'm worried about the safety of our employees. And, and I think we have to take a look at it and, and maybe eat it a little bit because the consequences, I think, could be dire if we don't. And maybe, maybe some of the other things is, say that switch here just went down. I spoke to Dennis, I mean, the school would have to shut down for a certain period. So, so Chris, again, I think all of us are very supportive of replacing the switch here. The question is how our Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the things is, my understanding is the switch gear is kind of like the roof of an energy saver. No, that, that's why when we did this, when I put this three out. Right, right, three right. But remember together, when they gave us the scenarios, they ran the train, the F39 thing on a 20 year, mm -hmm. but then the roof was on a 24 year. So would the switch gear be like a 24 year or no, a 20 year? We would have to work it into the 20 also. Okay. Um, and we use the same energy savings through all this as we use in the other one because there's no real energy savings. The only bonus with this is you can wrap it in to the project. You get the construction project as it is now, the, con the costs as they are now, and as we know, construction costs go up. So, and so this is, this is looking at stuff over time. If there is a year that we become flush with cash for some reason, we just saw how unpredictable it is and we took a big hit, there could be years where something happens. Um, like there's an alum who dies and we get like $20 million. Um, so in that, is there a penalty for paying early? So like in year 10 or year eight, we have extra cash. Would, Can we pay towards the principal? I would have, when I spoke to Jamie, she said we do have the ability to pay extra on to the principal. Okay. But I would like to double check before. You, you can call the bonds after five years. Yes, and get new interest rates if the rates yeah, are better. I think better. that's what Melissa is Anytime after that fifth year, you can call all or some of the bonds. So if you want to make an extra payment, so to speak, you don't have to call all of the outstanding bonds. You can call any portion of them to use that extra money and, and draw down your or lessen your debt. Okay. One, one thing, and I, look, I'm no expert in financing. I was, I was retired long ago. But you, you are dealing today in near record lows, and that's been holding for a couple of years. Chris would men know better than I, I think, but there is no guarantee that if you go out to finance this two, three, four years from now, that the rates that you're looking at today with this bond issue will hold. The cost of money could definitely go up. Yes, it could go down, but you can't stay at record lows forever. And when you're at an all-time low, it only goes up. Sure. And, we, and we've started to kind of itch up a little bit too. Right. So, just so this is why I was asking these questions because I'm kind of past that. Like I'm understanding, you know, liability, safety. It's something that we need, and this being really the only option for such a big project. And then it's really us just over the next years managing so that we can make that operating deficit smaller, so we can make these payments. I just that's why I was just asking these technical questions yeah, that's because it's understood. Like it's something. Yeah. And I, I'm very conservative with things. That's why I, can't, I won't sit here and tell you, yes, we can absolutely, you know, it's absolutely positive how we get around it. We can work towards it, but it's an opportunity cost right now. That, I think that's the biggest thing is if it goes in two or three years, hell, the roof's a little bit different with the way Dennis discussed that, but that that's a little bit different, I think, with the switch gear being the time that if anything would go down, being 50 years old, the issues we have had with it. Again, I think we're all supportive of it. I think the, the discussion last time was when we go through with this bond, we're committing ourselves to a, an annual payment, and it, it removes that flexibility that we've had the last couple of years to pick and choose things and move needles and, and dials up and down a little bit. So as long as you and Dennis and Gary are comfortable we, I said we might consider doing this if you all assert your comfort level that you'll make the budget work for the next three or four years to make sure we can get through periods when those are our required payments on a bond. So if you're 
the same requirements that we had six months ago are going to be present in three years. And if you're comfortable, you're going to make the operating budget work with this new higher level of, of debt load then. I, I think absolutely. Our, our always our goal is always to make the operating budget work and to eliminate any budget deficit that may arise. I, I really should commend you, Chris, because you really come in with fresh eyes and really attacked it using, uh, I don't want to be generous here, but using state-of-the-art, up-to-date uh, technology to sort of break things down for us and, and present it out of the book of accounts, which you know, is, is, pretty, is pretty complicated. So I think this really helps the board and the general public to see what we're looking at and how to plan ahead with that. And same with projections and getting that information from the public. Board, what, what, what questions? What, what, what's your... Any thoughts on that? <laughs> George Kelly. I just wish the issue of the switchboard, the discussion came up earlier as we were deciding about I agree. because it, it makes more sense and the horror danger. I didn't mean the long story, but you know, this this works. Make it work. You have to. It, it is what it is. It's a necessity. Like I said, it, it's a need for someone, I think, in this situation. And the fallout you can get from something bad happening with that far outweighs you know, what we would be paying per year. Right? Plus the downtime. Yes. Well, I mean, say it just went down. Dennis, we would have to ask Dennis for after like this. So what are we out for a week? And they gave him a look. Well, probably longer than that. By the time they get equipment in, do the repair, I mean, that's a massive project, so. And like technology, we will only be adding to current with more yeah. use of devices. You know, I hate spending that money. <laughs> that drives me crazy, so I'm thinking more on the need basis. So, so what would be our, what steps are we going to have to follow to now roll this into what we just passed and did at our last meeting? Well, I was going to jump in on that, so. The, the motion we passed at the last meeting was a not to exceed motion up to five million dollars. So we don't need, technically need any more action, official action to the board. Now the board wants to take action tonight to authorize up to the 4.4 or to authorize the uh, uh, doing a switch uh, gear project. That's fine, we can do that, but we would not be required. However, what we do need to do, if that's the direction the board wants to go, is we've got to get that information to uh, our financial people sooner than later, because there is going to come a time when they're not going to be able to add to it. They're, out, they're already working on the, the official statements, the preliminary official statements, and Jamie is out marketing to investors and so on, trying to you know set up with the terms and conditions of your bonding. Now, obviously, if you want to push the, uh, the, the sale back into June, you can do that, but hold on, I'm, I'm going I'm to go the next step. <laughs> you won't have the money then to do this project over the summer. So I don't want to say tonight is a drop dead night on this decision, but it's pretty close. I think you're calling telling us tonight is a drop dead night. Contracts. Right. Well, they're, I, I don't care if they say that. I said I don't care. <laughs> yeah, if, you, you, if you're going to do it, tonight's the night. Um, if, if, you know, if you get past the night, you're, other than doing something miraculously, you're, probably, you're not going to be able to accomplish it. So. And, we, and we have to remember, right, this, this isn't a bell and whistle or something, hey, we get this out of it. It's an operational thing. So, you know, that, that's really the thing. Much more fun to spend it on something that the kids can see and use more versus, okay, our electric fine. Our whole system's not going to have So that's the unfortunate thing about a project like this. But we said once again, what are, yeah, I, I think what we really need to think of, what are the bad outcomes? What are the negatives if we don't replace this? Let me quick question. Bill, my recollection is that we approved bond counts to go out for $5 million. Project, I think we approved at 3.8 or whatever the number was. Do we need to approve it at an addendum to that project? Eventually, you're going to have to do that, yes. Okay. But, and, and we could do that preliminarily tonight. But, but isn't the, that with train specifically? I'm sorry, Bruce? Isn't that with train specifically? 
That was specifically Switch trained, but we didn't train. authorize going and doing anything beyond the train project. We didn't do the roof, we didn't do the switchgear. So, uh, but as far as the thought itself is concerned, direction to Chris to get direction to Jamie and uh, just to, as I said, if we want to do a motion tonight to proceed with the switchgear project, we can do that. But eventually we're going to have to do a more specific what we're going to you know, what specifically is involved in it. And I'm, I'm not in a position to be able to you know, inspect that out. Do you need a straw, straw poll vote from the board to author well, it? To, to be clear, the board officers under that not to exceed are authorized to, to take it up. I think probably the safest thing to keep the record clear is to do a motion that would authorize the uh, the switch gear project at a, at a cost of a million dollars a month. Is it, is it roughly a million? Is it exactly a million? Is it? From what everything I've been told, we're right at that million mark. I would have to confirm that, though. So that to, to, to go in and, and confirm the final details and, and, and proceed and with the switch. And to direct the uh, board officers to uh, increase the bond issue accordingly. Right. Is there any board member who is has concerns they'd like to raise questions, further questions on that topic? And then address the board under the business. Nope. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Ann. is May 23rd. As of right now, we have 55 vendors willing to participate. Really excited. Uh, we were hoping for about 60, so that's a really good number. We have a wide variety of, uh, we've got 16 different career clusters that we're looking at, um, as well as in the military branch. So we have a really nice wide area to kind of cast our net to kind of get off the ground and running. Thank you, Chris, for that somebody else today. We're really excited. Um, and then also, too, our transition coordinator, Jerry Cape, and I have been working with Goodwill for the past, he's been working for the past couple of years and we've really looked at changing some of that relationship that we have with them. Goodwill has provided for us some vocational opportunities for our students with disabilities, as well as um, providing for in-house curriculum and other opportunities once the students then graduate and are OVR eligible. One of the projects we've been using with them in the past has been Project Search which is where we have a couple students that have run through that program where they go into the hospital. It's partnered with Mercy. And they do, will go through a nine-week rotation of the different areas. They'll go in through uh, delivery. They'll go to the building the receiving, deliver all the products that need to be dispersed at the hospital. They'll go through food service. They'll also work on the floors with the nurses and run through that rotation. This year, that is new, is the Good Steps program, which is part of Goodwill. And Good Steps is a program where they come into your building, they offer curriculum, it's a six week curriculum on transitional skills, and then we'll also do job placement for those students outside for a 90 hour paid work experience. And they get, I believe it's $12 an hour as their first part time job. And that's a 90 hour paid experience and it's paid through the state OVR program. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, it's called WIOA. Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And it's through the PETS, which is Pre-Employment Transition Services. That's one of the reg regulations and legislation that came out about two years ago with additional funding that went to OVR and was able to branch out to Goodwill. So this year is the first year we've been able to partner with Goodwill on the Good Steps program. And we have about 12 students participating. Uh, and then we found out, uh, I believe it was Friday, the first the place they receive placement at the Goodwill and Robinson. So we have um, seven students that are going to be taking up employment through that program. And so they'll be able to get their job, first job experience, rotate through their rotations as well, and then have a job coach and be able to be marketable when they graduate. So we're excited with that program, hoping 
they're going to expand it for more opportunities. And as Dr. Piper said, our ESL population is, we've kind of slowed with enrollment, so we're holding steady at 56 students, which is pretty much where we've been. Um, we've had a few students move in now, but it's been a very, we've slowed down on that. And special education numbers, we are at 253, which has been kind of holding steady as well. Go now to the principals and uh, start Mrs. Burleson. <coughs> jump rope for heart coming up that Mr. Ficarelli planned. We have the assembly coming up in May. We also have April, it's Autism Awareness Month. So we collect money and we hang puzzle pieces on our wall and it gets donated to the Autism um, Font Society. If you want to donate money, feel free to send money into Craft. And I believe Carnegie does it as well. So the amount is in there and they put your name on a little puzzle piece. all about PSSAs, um, PSSAs, more PSSAs, and the one cool thing that I wanted to share with you is PTA is putting together this gift for time. It's a gift of time. It's a fundraiser that the students are going to participate in. All the teachers gave an idea about different ways that they donate their time to the students. So for example, they got to shine with their different like interest. So Mr. DeRoss is donating like an hour of drum lessons. Um, I like to eat, so I'm donating lunch with principal. <laughs> I don't have any other skills, so I'm just kidding. But they love that pizza. Um, someone's doing like breakfast and cartoons. So you get to go to, I think it's first grade, and have breakfast and watch cartoons before school starts. So it's not, it's not supposed to be about money, we're just, you know, find ways that we can just donate our time. So they get to donate a dollar and ticket will be pulled out and that's the person who wins whatever cool activity they came up with. So I wanted to share that because Ms. Herman gave us or some shout outs to the Trib and I talked to the reporter from the Tribune Review today to, to share some of the great things we will be able to share some of our story. Um, I think that's it. Sorry requesting this one. Any questions? My daughter loves the donate time. Favorites are thanks. I'd like to go back with Mr. Locke. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. At the junior high school, we're also in the midst of uh, PSSA testing. I wanted to thank Mr. Mantis for really taking the lead on that and helped us run a fine orchestrated machine. It's uh, gone very smoothly. <coughs> Simultaneously, speaking of time and donating time, we created that space upstairs for kids to have time of their own to explore their passion. And today was the first day. Last week we had the students uh, have a, a day of tours through the shop and ran them through the social studies classes. And today was the first day that it was open. And I am very proud and excited to say there were 111 students in the shop. And these students the thing that I found very interesting, and I'm looking at the data report here right now, is of the students, uh, about 60% from the junior high, uh, which serves as one of our areas of focus, is the strength and the transition program, and 40% were from the senior high school. 
and when they sign in, they have to uh, identify what area they're going to work on. And all of the stations had a pretty even distribution of attention, uh, which was really exciting. And uh, for example, 21% were in the gaming station, the gaming station. 13.5% um, were in the board gaming station. That was, uh, I saw some children playing chess when I got to work this morning. Uh, the nail station had 14.4% of the students. Uh, the recording studio was a huge hit. Eighth grade when I went up there today, it was, uh, had about seven or eight students in it. So the plan is uh, the first day very successful and it makes it exciting and the kids uh, seem to be buzzing about it. Uh, and I want to thank you once again for the support in this as we uh, went after that. And, uh, that's, and now we're just getting ready for May Madness. Some people call it March Madness, but I say May Madness at high school uh, with all the activities coming up for the closure of the year. But uh, we are strong, so it's great. We'll be happy to answer any questions. I had a couple of parents ask if there was going to be any opportunity for the public to tour that space. Thank you for reminding me. That also sparks a reminder. Uh, April 23rd is the Taste of Arlington that the Education Foundation is hosting. And we're hoping to have some subtle displays of student work from the shop at the Taste of Arlington on May 28th. It's either first or second, we're having a Remake Learning Day, uh, which is in partnership with the Create Labs and the Grable Foundation and the, that group of people. And we have from 1 to 4 p.m. an open to the public tour of the space. So they can get a maybe an hour worth of seeing kids in there, and then uh, the, the other couple hours, then it can be uh, people and they'll be after school, and then there'll be people more. Will that be on the website? So yes, ma'am. What was that I believe it's May 21st, but I, I, it's either the 21st or the 22nd. The calendar's pretty crowded in my head right now, <laughs> so I apologize. Any other questions? Real quick, so I love what everyone did up there. I know there's like a dozen people or more that were involved with that, and it's really turned out great. My kids are all excited to, to look at one, they all said that they were all kind of interested, they were kind of indifferent when they saw it, they were all impressed and couldn't wait to participate in person. Um, and I think Leanne's question is great. Now that we have this awesome space, what can we do with it that we haven't already thought of? What other ways can we engage the community? Can we have small summer camps, just groups of 10 people that can focus on one of the stations? Can we bring in kids? Can we bring in adults? It opens up a ton of possibilities. So, I don't want to overwhelm you, but maybe plant that seed and start working with your colleagues and, and planting seeds with them and just seeing how we can leverage that, that resource, that asset. So, Absolutely. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Now, that concludes the administrative reports. We'll look at our committee reports. Um, with Director Apple not being here tonight, George, any update for Parkway? Have you been able to? Recently, I'm not sure. For sure, this uh, this month's meeting will be this coming Wednesday. But last month, uh, we we tried to gather names of architects for this. Apparently, some of our school districts actually had in those architects, and we're getting bids on the roof for the main building. We should be opening the bids at, at the May meeting. We'll choose by the June. We spoke in the last meeting of the old water line. It's from around 1965. <laughs> Wouldn't you know, during the Easter break, the line broke. But luckily it was <coughs> during the break, uh, they only lost two school days afterwards. And, um, and this break was between the T-track and the main road. Um, they were really concerned about the new pressure going through it <coughs> causing other breaks because this is a, what is that, 50 old, plus 50 old line. Uh, but once they put on the pressure, everything was fine. Graduation will be June 6th, and there are no graduates from Carlton. That's it. Okay. Uh, 
about uh, PAC fund, right? The grief updates on PAC fund? Yeah, that was the PAC fund. Yeah. Oh, that was the PAC fund. No, this was the PAC I know, but he's the old uh, Are you the old one? But I was, I think we were on the road from New York City. Because I, I was confused that the update for Parkway sounded a lot like the old car fund. Oh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the water water line, line break. <laughs> no, that was that one. Okay, thank you. Briefly, uh, Parkway tonight is there. Uh, National uh, Technical Honor Society induction. Rachel Catuso is independent from the district. Uh, they also have their summer camp that they're getting in place for uh, elementary and, and uh, middle school kids uh, to go out and check what they may want to see if they want to take a consider career technical careers. Uh, again, in discussions that we had with the superintendents forward with additional funding for the Energy Innovation Center partnership uh, and provide that and that Darby is also the procedure, let me rephrase that, Darby is also continuing to look at the replacement of the HVAC system over there, it's uh, pretty outdated and he's working on adding a diesel mechanics program so he's been approaching different uh, private manufacturers for that. So that's still, that probably will not be up in place for our kids for next year. <clears throat> Shop space is there. But we got to get, you know, with that program, they try to get some donated parts and engines for a specific program. So that's about it for Parkway. Uh, our, the superintendent's meeting there recently was at the Energy Innovation Center last week. And uh, we'll have the next Parkway meeting will be coming up in May. Any updates on Shaz's for us? As a matter of fact, with uh, Shasta, we have our uh, very own alumnus, Connor uh, Richardson, will be the featured speaker at the Shasta Student Award Ceremony, which will be Saturday, April 28th, South Point in the morning. Uh, our two students here who presented uh, for their involvement in the Energy Innovation Center, uh, Sean Setting and uh, Jod, Jed, they will be our honored students there. Uh, and it, that's, a, that's a good event. And uh, Shaz is quickly coming to a close. Uh, we have one more meeting with the superintendents in May after the April meeting. And then we'll plan ahead for 1819. All right, thank you. Dr. Simpson, any updates on PSBA? Um, just a few things. Um, just to follow up, we talked last time about the uh, Governor of the School Safety Task Force. Just wanted to report they had their first meeting. It seemed like there was a lot of feedback on the mental health aspect of things. So that seems to be a lot of where they are. Some of their efforts um, as far as what's going on in the state the PA House Education Committee has um, approved the following House Bill 564 which requires students to take an assessment in US history government and civics so that is going to be a requirement um, however they're allowing some flexible provisions um, so it's requiring school entity to administer a locally developed assessment uh, also, House Bill 1228 allows students to wear protective clothing and sunscreen without a prescription. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so I had to bring that up considering our conversation about, about you know, what's, what's allowed there. So that's about it. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions of any committee reports? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank not, we'll move on. Under the miscellaneous section of our agenda, I'll entertain a motion to approve number one. The additions to the 2017-2018 conference and field trip requests as submitted. Number two, elect William L. Cooper to the Board of Trustees for the Western Region of the Allegheny County Schools Health Insurance, Insurance Consortium for a two-year period effective April 30th, 2018. Got a motion for those two items? Thank you, George. Do I have a second? Second. Move second. Any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion carries. Under Section 2, Finance, we have five items. I'll entertain a motion to approve, number one, the March 2018 bills in the amount of $731,071.34. Number two, Resolution number 2018-1, hereby adopting the operation budget for the South Central Area Special Schools Committee, Pathfinder, for the school year of 2018-2019 as set forth in the proposed budget the amount totaling $167,000. Number three, the March 2018 athletic fund report with a netting balance of $13,241.78. Number four, 
March 2018 Activities Fund report with an ending balance of $90,642.80. And number five, the Food Service Management Renewal Year Comp. Food Service Management Renewal Year Cost Reimbursable Contract. It's a, it's a state form. <coughs> for the period of June 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019, pending approval from the Department of Education Division of Food and Nutrition. So I have a motion for those five items. So moved. Moved, second. Second. Second, any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. And next year I will practice that before I try to say it. Section number three, personnel, we have seven items. I'll entertain a motion to approve number one, reassign Carrie Gallagher to the position of junior senior high school guidance office secretary, a class one position in terms of the SCA collective bargaining unit agreement. Number two, award the position of systems administrator, technology assistant to Angela Zanone at a salary of $45,000 under the terms of the SCA collective bargaining unit agreement. Number three, award the position of director of technology to Joe Rodello at a salary of $75,000 under the terms of the Act 93 agreement. Number four, reassign Mary Straka to the position of one-to-one -one personal 